Okay, thank you very much, and it's a pleasure to be here. I speak Russian, but I will give the lecture in English because of scientific terms that I don't know. Uh, so it's a pleasure to be here, and thanks for organizers to, for organizing this talk. I will be talking about a very new phenomenon uh, that is called fast radio bursts, and they are mysterious because we still don't know the origin of these sources. We see a fast radio burst here, uh, depicted in this uh, uh, picture, observed by a Parkes telescope uh, in Australia. So a brief summary of facts. Fast radio bursts uh, are a completely new type of transients, and transients are signals that vary with time fast, as we will see today. First FRB was detected recently in 2001, and it was so unusual that only in 2007 it was published. So it was detected in an archival survey, uh, archival survey of pulsars, not immediately, and uh, it took many years to, uh, to go through verifications and publish it. Now fast radio bursts are detected almost every day by uh, world, world largest and most sensitive radio telescopes. Uh, they are very short, extremely short. Uh, the duration typically is just a few milliseconds, so you can imagine. Uh, and they are extremely bright, almost as bright as a supernova. Uh, we still don't know what their origin is, despite that we've been observing them for almost 20 years. They're still a mystery. They just don't fit uh, into any theory. And we don't know of any sources that could produce them for sure. There are, of course, theories. Uh, that's the theor job of a theorist to come up with crazy explanations, but uh, we don't have any good guess. Uh, we know today that most fast radio bursts come from far away, far uh, behind our galaxy, sometimes from um, they were originated uh, 11 giga years ago or two giga years ago, and they travel huge cosmological distances from the source to us. Despite that, they're still observed today, which means that they're intrinsically extremely bright. They're also extremely frequent. Uh, today we know that uh, an FRB, uh, a thousand FRBs happen every day per sky. So from the entire sky, we can collect thousand FRBs every day. Uh, and uh, they're just one-time event. It's not like a pulsar that repeats periodically. It's uh, a burst that goes off, and then the source is silent. There are only few FRBs that were uh, shown to repeat, but most of them, out of few hundred that we have detected today, have not repeated. And they are, they're called radio bursts because they're observed in the radio regime, uh, actually between 400 megahertz and 1,400 uh, 1, megahertz uh, by ra radio telescopes. This is an example of world of one of the largest telescopes with a diameter of 300 meters located in Puerto Rico. So fast radio bursts were first detected in 2001 in archival data of pulsar survey of the Magellanic clouds. Um, and uh, by telescope that is called Parkes Radio Telescope, it's huge, 64 meter di diameter, and this telescope is located in Australia. The reason why radio telescopes are usually located in uh, remote places such as Australian Desert or South Africa or Atacama Desert in Chile is because they're super sensitive. They can detect even a mobile phone on the moon so that they are that sensitive and they have to be placed into radio quiet regions to detect cosmological and astrophysical objects. This is an example of the uh, fast radio burst. Uh, the, it, the signal is shown as a function of frequency on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. And this bright line that you see here is the burst on this uh, Top panel, you see that uh, there is a kind of uh, background, and then we see a burst, and then it goes quiet again. And we will be, talk to, we will be talking today why it, it swaps diagonally through this diagram, through the space 
frequency time space. And there is a reason for that. So on this diagram, we see that it's indeed a few milliseconds, and uh, it swaps radio frequencies, in this case, between 1,200 uh, 1, megahertz and uh, 1,500 1, megahertz. This particular burst was extremely bright, uh, 60 billion times uh, the luminosity of the sun, so you can imagine, uh, and it was just a few milliseconds, so just a huge burst of energy. Because it was so unusual, there are no counterparts uh, that we knew before existence of such bursts. Um, initially, people didn't know if they were astrophysical or maybe some terrestrial interference from radio sources. As I said, the radio telescopes are extremely sensitive. So they actually, uh, the scientists were thinking that maybe radio uh, waves are produced by microwaves, and um, we know that if we open and close a microwave, a burst of energy in, in this particular frequency range is produced uh, because there are magnetic fields inside the microwave. So actually in radio observatories, microwaves are put in Faraday cages, such as this one in the uh, uh, Jodrell Bank radio telescope observatory, where one of the world's sensitive telescopes is located, the Lowell telescope. So indeed, there were few observations of fast radio bursts that people originally thought were FRBs uh, that were found to be microwave bursts at parks. Uh, and that's why also Lorimer's burst, the, the very first one, this one, it's called the Lorimer burst after the guy who found it, so originally, people thought it was just a microwave, and they were referring to these bursts as peritons, so some mythological creature that doesn't exist in reality. Fortunately, uh, Lorimer's burst turned out to be the real astrophysical event. So we know that they are astrophysical because uh, nowadays many telescopes around the world detect fast radio bursts. They were just very tricky to detect at first because they are really narrow and it's hard to find them if you're not looking for them on purpose. So after, actually, detection of Lorimer's burst, there were several years when people couldn't find any new FRBs, and it was really weird. But fortunately, in 2013, uh, four new FRBs were detected and published, also using Parkes radio telescope here. Uh, and then uh, in 2012, an, a new FRB was detected by Arecibo. This, this telescope is huge, uh, 300 meters, and it's just carved inside a quarry in Puerto Rico, so it's really fantastic, I think. I think it was uh, featured in one of the movies, The Contact. <laughs> um, so this telescope is extremely sensitive, and it has great resolution. It has detected an FRB called 121102, uh, which actually is the one of the two repeating F, one of the few repeating FRBs that we have, and I'll talk about it today as well. So nowadays we have a lot of FRBs and many more are coming online. Uh, Seventy-eight are actually published and verified, uh, but there are many more uh, in the pipeline. Uh, at least three hundred events are known. And they're detected by different telescopes around the globe from different locations, which also uh, shows that FRBs are astrophysical and not coming from particular terrestrial radio interference. Uh, one of the key telescopes now is CHIME, and I will be also talking about it today. It's a cylindrical uh, telescope uh, built of four th cylinders, and you see people here for, this, for scale. Uh, it's very... It has a huge field of view, so it collects FRBs from a wide area of the sky, but it has very poor localization, and if it, locates FR, uh, if it detects FRB, it doesn't know where it comes from. Uh, CHIME recently came online, less than a year ago, and co collected immediately almost 300 FRBs in just a few months, compared to the depth of FRBs in the first few years after the first detection. Uh, then we have ASCAP, which uh, is also a fundamental instrument for FRBs, and they will also talk about it today. 
It is composed of 36 telescopes, 12 meters each, located in Australian West uh, Desert in Western Australia. And it is a, a very sensitive telescope. It can operate in flight uh, eye mode when each telescope is looking into a different direction. And this multiplies the collecting area of the telescope. Uh, we already saw Parks, which was the telescope uh, that first detected FRBs, Arecibo, uh, JBT in Canada, and Malonglo in, in Australia. So each one of them saw at least one FRB, or many, uh, and throughout years, so starting uh, in 2001 and until today. Uh, also, scientists uh, and researchers who are searching for extraterrestrial intelligence actually contribute to FRB science because they are trying to detect radio signals produced by aliens. Uh, and uh, they actually are now very well funded uh, by Russian millionaire <laughs> Yuri Milner, actually, who lives in the US. Uh, and um, Yuri contributed a large chunk of money to this research uh, that this is a program that runs on the, again, a part of these telescopes are participating, and he bought off time on these telescopes to particularly search for uh, alien signals. Uh, these tel telescopes are very sensitive, and they can actually hear uh, aircraft uh, if it was on one of the southern stars around us. So that far, they can hear radio signals. Uh, and sometimes this research actually uh, report new FRBs and contribute to the program because they just uh, search and at the, in the same frequency range and using the same telescopes. If you are interested to learn details about fast radio bursts, there is an online catalog that is uh, always updated and it is uh, ru uh, run by one of the main researchers in the field, Emily Petrov, who is in Australia. Uh, it's a catalog of all FRBs that are confirmed, uh, and uh, there are many fields that you can look at, for example, central frequency of the burst, bandwidth, which telescope has detected it, uh, since, uh, the flux, energy, and so on. So everything is here, and uh, you can play with it. It's really interesting. And right now it has uh, 78 FRBs uh, out of the few hundreds that we know. So by now, we know that FRBs are very varied. Uh, this is a slide that shows some of them, and we see that there is always a burst present, but otherwise they look very different. For example, this one uh, is very strong, and the background is kind of smooth compared to it. Uh, others are wider. For example, this one is very wide and, and smoothed out. Most of them are very narrow. Uh, and they have been detected throughout years. So this number, for example, 110214, shows the year, the month, and the date of the detection. So you see that there are births from year 2011 through 18, 2018 here. And these are not all of them, of course. Uh, we also know that they are abundant, as I mentioned, if you build a cosmological model accounting for all galaxies in the universe that we can do using uh, astrophysical modeling, collapse fractions, uh, and star formation rates, uh, then we can actually predict how many FRBs we expect to see from the sky, even including the smallest galaxies to the largest galaxies, and using some scaling relations to translate FRB rate per galaxy from the known sources. Uh, we, we get that uh, there are between 1,000 and 10,000 FRBs per sky per day uh, that we can observe. Of course, some of them would be very, at very large cosmological distances and be very faint for the current telescopes to detect, but uh, there are future facilities that are already planned that will be sensitive enough to detect these bursts. Uh, most likely, the bursts are produced by star formation activity, and we expect them to follow uh, structure that we see on the sky. So here we see uh, what is called cosmic web, the uh, network of filaments, galaxies, galaxy clusters, uh, and FRBs are emitted along these uh, filaments here and uh, galaxy clusters. 
So we expect them to follow the, the structure of uh, star formation activity. Till now, the surveys of FRBs were so all FRBs were found kind of by mistake. The first one was found in the archival data of pulsars, uh, and uh, people didn't think that they're serious things, so they were finding them just uh, from uh, other kind of surveys. But now people, uh, scientists become more uh, interested and the community become, becomes more aware in that it's a really cool science, so targeted searches are on the way. So even with these uh, random searches, uh, many FRBs were found, uh, as I mentioned, 300 or so were found by mistake or randomly, and this also shows us that FRBs are very frequent. So if we do a targeted search, we expect to find many of them. So the main question, one of the main questions is uh, where FRBs are coming from. Are they part of our uh, terrestrial activity? Maybe they're produced by something in the magnetosphere of Earth. Uh, are they coming from our own solar system? Maybe they are solar flares or something, or, or maybe they are created by extra solar planets or come from our galaxy, or maybe they're coming from distant space. And today we are sure that uh, most of the FRBs are coming from far away, from far away in, in the space. They occasionally can occur in our galaxy, but chances for that are tiny. So to determine what is the uh, origin of FRBs, actually the shape of the signal is the key. Uh, this is from the original publication by Lorimer in 2007. And on the insert here, we see the pulse itself. It's very narrow, and this is a noise. Uh, and on the, this diagram, frequency versus time, we see the pulse uh, as a function of frequency and time. This pulse is what is called dispersed because we see that uh, higher frequencies arrive earlier than, later fre than lower frequencies. And this feature is actually a key for us to understand what is the distance of FRB sources between the FRB sources and us. So this fact that uh, there is a diagonal on this plot and the, not a sharp line tells us that different frequencies travel with different speed across the intergalactic, in, across the medium. So dispersion is just what we, we are used to see in rainbow or diamonds. We see that uh, the white line uh, is split into a, a rainbow of colors. And this is just because every frequency travels with different speed in the medium and this uh, um, the refraction works differently as a function of frequency. So as the white light, white light is a mixture of different wavelengths, as we know, enters a prism, it is dispersed, and every frequency has different propagation speed in, in glass or in the medium. This feature, or the speed of, uh, fre of uh, every wavelength, depends on few uh, things so it's both the length or the uh, path of the frequent of the light inside the medium. For example, here we see as the light goes through diamond, uh, the dispersion increases. So the difference between different wavelengths and colors increases. But it is also a function of medium itself, properties of medium. For example, here on this uh, panel, uh, there is a reg regular optical glass versus uh, some weird type of glass. And we see that uh, there is a different uh, distance between different colors, depending on the type of the glass. So two, th two, two things matter, the length of the path and the properties of the medium in which uh, light propagates. Absolutely same thing happens with radio waves in ionized gas or medium. Here we see that uh, in ionized medium, shorter wavelengths move faster than uh, longer wavelengths. Right. And the amount of dispersion, amount of the difference between 
the, path, uh, the arrival time of uh, blue light compared to red light depends on, the, uh, on how long the path is between the source and the observer, this is a telescope, and also the amount of uh, the properties of the medium itself. So what disperses radio waves is um, ionized gas. So the denser is the gas, the more dispersion there is. And uh, we define dispersion measure, just the quantitative amount of how much the light is dispersed by integrating the density of electrons along the line of sight between the, the source and the telescope. So the longer it's the distance between the source and the telescope and the denser is the gas, the higher will be dispersion measure. And vice versa, if the source of FRBs is very close to us and the medium is neutral, the light will not be dispersed at all. So we can calculate this dispersion measure or measure it directly from the sources and interpret it in terms of, of the distance between FRBs and the telescope. And that's what scientists do here. So they can calculate by how much uh, the blue or uh, higher radio frequencies arrive than earlier than um, lower radio frequencies. They can calculate this dispersion measure uh, and then translate it in terms of astronomical distances. For all detected FRBs, dispersion measure varies between a few hundreds to a few thousands. And actually, if you, in, if you just uh, translate it in terms of distances, uh, it means that FRBs are emitted very far from us, and they travel between 3 to 11 giga years since the time they were emitted to, to today when they are observed. So in terms of cosmological redshift, those of you who know what it is, some of, F some of the detected FRBs arrive from a redshift 3, and it, that's when the star formation actually peaked. So we know that they are cosmological and they can probe interesting events in cosmic history. So this plot shows uh, the dispersion measure divided by the contribution of our galaxy. So some of our galaxy has dense gas uh, and uh, contributes to the total observed dispersion measure of fast radio bursts. So this measure as a function of uh, dispersion measure itself. And we see that for FRBs shown uh, with blue dots here, this uh, measure is greater than one, which means that they are all extra galactic, come uh, far away from our, outside from our galaxy, while other known radio sources such as uh, um, rotating radio transients or um, pulsars uh, shown in red and black come mostly from inside of our galaxy. So I mentioned CHIME, this cylindrical telescope, and it was actually a game changer because it uh, overnight, uh, as soon as it was turned on, started detecting uh, tens and tens FRBs. Uh, and what they report today, they probably have many more in their pipeline, they just don't bother to <laughs> tell anyone um, anymore, <laughs> because there are just so many of them. So they have detected a few hundred FRBs uh, with high di dispersion measures. So again, most of them are coming from far away, from high, large cosmological distances. And uh, this map shows the distribution of uh, fast radio bursts across the sky. So here I show the declination versus right ascension. These are just two coordinates on the sky. And we see that FRBs are more or less distributed uniformly along this map. So they're just coming from all around us. They're not coming specifically from the plane of our galaxy. Uh, and so they're not correlated with the galaxy. Uh, with the Milky Way. And this is another indication that they are cosmological. Uh, the color here shows the dispersion measure, again, divided by the dispersion measure of our own galaxy. And for most of them, it's greater than one. So most of the points here is, are blue, shown, showing that they are highly extragalactic. This, by the way, is not published. It's from a recent presentation that uh, PI of CHIME gave at one of the conferences. I'm actually not sure I can show it. 
<laughs> okay. So if we place uh, FRBs in terms of uh, cosmological distances, uh, this cartoon shows the evolution of the universe starting from the Big Bang, uh, which happened 13.7 uh, giga years ago. And then the universe undergoes a, uh, a series of astronomical transitions. Uh, it, at the beginning, there was no matter. It was only energy. And then matter appeared, atoms formed. Uh, the universe was first fully ionized, and then neutral atoms were created. So it became highly neutral in the intermediate uh, period when first stars were just started to f were forming. And then actually, appearance of uh, stars and galaxies contributed to reionization, what is called because stars emit, ga uh, emit photons in the ultraviolet uh, range that can ionize the gas again. So today, all the medium between stars and galaxies is uh, ionized to high uh, percentage. So uh, the observed FRBs actually probe uh, this history already to uh, large cosmological distances from the peak of star formation. Uh, and then can, they can originate in one of these distant galaxies that are observed today by telescopes such as Hubble, for example, or other sensitive telescopes. So hopefully in future, when we have many more of them and uh, more sensitive telescopes detect them from even higher redshifts, we can use them as cosmological probes. Uh, one of the interesting Im implications uh, or applications of fast radio bursts, if they exist at very large cosmological distances, even larger than we see today, is to probe the epoch of reionization. So as I mentioned, uh, the universe was very, uh, was fully ionized at a very early time, short, shortly after a Big Bang. Then it became neutral, and then stars started reionizing it. So yellow here, yellow regions are the regions of ionized gas. So, so far we detect FRBs from this uh, area when the medium between star forming regions is fully ionized. And so the dispersion measure increases as FRB for more distant FRBs. So on this panel we see dispersion measure as a function of the redshift of or distance of uh, fast radio bursts from us. Uh, and this dispersion measure grows as FRB is placed at more at larger cosmological distances. This is again because all the intergalactic medium at that time was ionized uh, and we just integrate um, along a larger uh, path. But imagine if FRB is uh, emitted when the universe was still neutral, then uh, the propagation of light from that time to the beginning of the reionization era will not contribute to dispersion measure. Uh, and we would see a flattening uh, in this function of uh, dispersion measure versus the location of FRB. So in the future, if we have a bunch of them from very early times, uh, we will see this flattening in this function, and we will be able to constrain theories of reionization, which are poorly constrained today. So here you see red and black different lines. Uh, and they're just showing. Uh, different histories of how fast the universe was reionized by first stars. So potentially it's very useful if we have a lot of them and there are actually bright perspectives, for example, square kilometer array, which is coming online in Australia and South Africa, will be actually sensitive to fast radio bursts uh, at the beginning of the epoch of reionization if they exist there. So a square kilometer array will have different antennas uh, covering almost a square kilometer on the ground, extremely sensitive, and also scanning a large uh, portion of radio frequencies. So we hope to observe more FRBs with, with that telescope. So compared to what we see today, this chunk of the history of the universe we would go much deeper with square kilometer array. So we know that FRBs are coming from large cosmological distances, and we can still see them 
and they are, so, so this must tell us that they, they are intrinsically extremely bright, because if we place a source far away from us, the amount of photons that uh, can be detected in the telescope uh, is uh, decreased, uh, follows this inverse square uh, law, so it's, uh, it, go, it drops uh, as a radius squared. Just because the photons are distributed around the sphere, uh, and if the telescope has a finite uh, area, it will collect only so much photons. So the further its FRB, the less of its photons reach the telescope. And the fact that we can detect them today means that they're extremely bright when they are uh, created. Uh, the FRBs that are seen today are almost as bright as pulsars, and that's why they were detected by pulsar surveys, which means they're about one Jansky. Uh, but they are uh, 10 to the 6 times further away than pulsars that we know from the dispersion measure. So following this inverse uh, uh, square uh, law, we know that they must be 10 to the 12 times brighter than a pulsar. So tremendously bright. OK, so if we have a bright source of light, uh, what are energetics of it, and how can we understand where it comes from? Uh, I will show you the luminosity function of FRBs. I have already shown, but let's understand it. So luminosity function is the dependence of luminosity on time. And for some sources, it's almost constant. For example, sun is more or less stable. Uh, but for other sources like supernovae and FRBs, it varies with time. So this is a, a luminosity function of sun. It, we know it's peri periodic sun undergoes uh, periods of brighter, uh, it, sometimes it's brighter, sometimes it's dim dimmer, and it varies on the time scale of few years, right? Uh, there are flux, uh, there are periodic oscillations in solar luminosity. Pulsars, which are uh, highly magnetized neutron stars that are, rotate very quickly few milliseconds, uh, so it's a star that uh, orbits around itself in few milliseconds super quickly, and it emits a jet of radiation which can be detected. So these pulsars are extremely periodic with time, so their light curve varies in time with very precise uh, periodicity. On the other hand, supernova is another, another example of transient. It's not periodic, it's a cataclysmic event. A star explodes, right? Uh, it's extremely bright because all the energy of sun goes into this explosion. Uh, but the light curves decay on the time scale of many days. For example, these are two types of light curves, type 1a and type, uh, type 1 and type 2 supernovae which differ in the amount of uh, chemical elements uh, that goes into it, so the luminosity varies. Uh, but for both of these curves, they're extremely bright, uh, 10 billion time, times uh, brighter than the sun at its maximum. And then this light decays with time on the time scale of a few hundred days. However, supernovae stay bright for even centuries in some cases. In, in, well, in, most, in, in all cases. Uh, this is an, exa an example of Tycho's supernovae. Tycho Brahe uh, has detected this, this one, and uh, it was just seen by eye. It was so bright, located in, uh, I forgot in which cluster, Virgo. So anyway, he showed this star here that uh, appeared overnight, and that actually is a supernovae that exploded at the same time. And we can see it still today. Uh, this is its remnant. So the star is not no longer there, but the remnant is still visible and emits radio waves. So supernovae is a transient that varies on the time scale of centuries. Unlike uh, that, uh, and uh, unlike anything else that they have shown, fast radio bursts are seem to be cataclysmic events. They don't repeat most of them, and they are uh, extremely short radio transients. So that's uh, the 
light curve of a, uh, of a fast radio burst. So I told you that they are not periodic uh, and probably cataclysmic, but actually few uh, fast radio bursts have repeated. We have detected few that repeat. There is no periodicity in them. They repeat chaotically, sporadically, uh, and that actually makes things even harder. If most FRBs don't repeat and some repeat uh, and randomly, what, what is their nature? So if it makes a simple calculation and compare the energy emitted uh, in sun by, sun by the sun supernovae versus fast radio bursts, we can see that actually fast radio burst is intrinsically as bright as supernova. So 10 to the 10 brighter than the sun in some cases, uh, but it's very narrow in time. So the overall energy that is emitted is much uh, smaller than the supernovae. So uh, the supernovae emits uh, about 10 to the 44 joules per unit mass, while faster burst uh, emits around 10 to the 33 joules. So overall energy is, very, uh, is much smaller, but the brightness, instantaneous brightness at the time of emission is almost the same. So we have many questions to answer with observations, and they, most of them are not answered yet. Uh, some of the key questions is it in what kind of environments are supernovae pro are FRBs produced? Uh, what are the progenitors or sources of these uh, bright uh, flares? And uh, if there are several populations or all, all FRBs are the same, maybe they all repeat and we have just haven't detected them. So now the community became more interested in that and uh, more funding went into this research. So uh, there are targeted searches for fast radio bursts. Uh, however, most of the telescopes are not uh, really, they're very sensitive, but they're not really, uh, they don't have high resolution. For example, Parks that has detected the first FRB has a beam size of two degrees on the sky which is even larger than the moon. The moon has half a degree size on the sky. So uh, if Parks detects an FRB, it, uh, scientists cannot tell where exactly on the sky it happened. We know the precision uh, up to two degrees, plus minus a degree. So we can know how many of them they are, but we don't know exactly where they're coming from. And it makes our ident identification of the host galaxy more difficult. Uh, luckily, uh, some telescopes do have good resolution. For example, Arecibo has a, uh, a very, it's a very high resolution telescope, uh, and it has detected a very particular kind of FRBs, of a, a, a repeater one. The fact that this FRB repeats allowed us to uh, pinpoint the location, identify the galaxy, and also follow up the source by other telescopes. The Arecibo FRB is uh, extragalactic. It is located at the redshift uh, 0.2. And the question is if it's representative or not. So the fact that Arecibo sees many repetitions doesn't mean that other telescopes would also see many repetitions. For example, CHIME. When they tried to detect uh, this FRB, they were not able to because they are less sensitive. So Arecibo at that time was seeing repetitions while CHIME couldn't. So that's how the FRB host looks like on the F uh, Arecibo um, field of view. This dot is the bright uh, is the galaxy where FRB is coming from, as shown here also. Uh, and this uh, actually, sorry, it's not a Arecibo field of view, it's an image taken by a follow-up, uh, very large array telescope uh, that was following up Arecibo observations. So the repeater, this FRB is known as the repeater because at the time it was the only one which was repeating, it has this uh, ID number 121102 because it was detected in year 2012 in November. 
There was a number of follow-ups by different telescopes, both on the ground and in the sky, the very high-resolution uh, VLA telescope. Uh, on the sky, there were observations with uh, Chandra and XMM in X-ray bands, and there were optical observations, and various radio telescopes were trying to follow it up. It was actually really a global effort to try to detect the galaxy, identify the galaxy, understand what kind of uh, environment there is, what kind of metallicity, composition, and so on. So unfortunately, uh, X-ray telescopes haven't detected anything, so there is no X-ray emission that goes with this source. Also, not all of the radio telescopes have detected the emission. For example, Effelsberg, which looks at higher radio frequencies, uh, wasn't able to see it but uh, VLA wasn't, uh, that's how we could identify the galaxy. So this is again the snapshot of this galaxy. It looks like a blob because it's a really tiny galaxy located far away. Here on the sky we can see it also, this uh, little green dot. So these multiple observations have shown that this galaxy is tiny, it has a stellar mass of 5 10 to the 10 to 10 to the 7 solar masses so it's rel relatively small it is uh, very poor in terms of chemical uh, uh, chemical composition so it is kind of a very primordial galaxy which has not been enriched by supernovae efficiently it has primordial composition of uh, elements in it uh, and it's a very unusual galaxy. So the, most of the galaxies at this redshift at that cosmological time were already much more massive and uh, enriched by, metallic, by metals uh, from supernova explosions. So this galaxy is uh, similar to Magellanic clouds. Also, this galaxy is actively forming stars, which is not also trivial. Most of the some of the galaxies are... Uh, old and don't form stars so efficiently at these redshifts, but this one is small and active. And uh, this observation also, also showed that FRB resides uh, in a radio nebula, uh, which has um, magnetized plasma in it. So CHIME, this uh, wonderful cylindrical telescope, has uh, since then detected few uh, repeaters. This is a uh, um, picture of R2, the second uh, repeater, compared to R1, the repeater detected by Arecibo. And we see that there are similarities in terms of this uh, uh, frequency time diagram. There is kind of structure that we still don't understand where it is coming from, but they seem to be originating from the same physical uh, mechanism. So uh, this one is published, but uh, CHEM has few more repeaters that they are reporting on con at conferences that uh, they have in their pipelines. Because CHEM has a very poor localization, it it's built uh, so that uh, it has a very wide field of view, but very, uh, in order to detect many FRBs, but uh, it, it cannot tell us where they are coming from. Uh, even follow-up experiments uh, and observations could not pin down this FRB, so we don't know still where it is coming from and what type of galaxy it resides. Actually, a week ago, there was another major discovery made by ASCAP, this uh, telescope, array of telescopes in uh, Australia. Uh, and uh, the discovery was in that they were able to localize uh, and, and new FRB, even though it wasn't repeating. And this is due to the fact that ASCAP's antennas were looking in different directions, and they can actually follow an FRB from antenna to antenna. And by measuring the delay of in time uh, in which a, an FRB is detected by each one of the antenna, they can reconstruct where it is coming from. So if an FRB is coming from this direction, these antennas we would see it first, and then uh, it will appear in these antennas. So that's how they can uh, understand what was the direction of the FRB on the sky. And actually, the localization is very good. 
uh, 10 arc, arc seconds or so. Uh, and ASCAP is looking at the same frequencies as sparks, uh, so um, 1.3 gigahertz. Uh, it has another capability of just looking randomly in the sky. Uh, it's called flight height mode, and this increases its um, uh, field of view. So this is how uh, this new FRB looks like. It's, again, a typical, very narrow, and very bright. Uh, and uh, the surprising thing that uh, it revealed is that uh, the galaxy, uh, the host galaxy of this FRB is a completely different thing from the Arecibo one. In the first repeater, we, we saw that the galaxy is very small, metal poor, uh, and um, is actively forming stars. This one shows a different type of galaxy completely. It's an old galaxy with an old uh, stellar population. No new stars are forming almost. And it's also very massive. So the first one was 5, 10 to the 7 solar masses. This one is 2 times 10 to the 10. So a 1,000 times more massive in terms of stellar mass. Uh, and it's also very enriched by metals and uh, uh, quiet. Also, no repetitions were detected from this FRB at all. So it's probably a different thing from the Recibo event. It doesn't have this structure uh, as the repeater, so this uh, structure is, doesn't appear here. It's a very narrow thing. Uh, and after, uh, after ASCAP was able to localize it, many other telescopes looked at it, like uh, DES, VLT, Gemini, and Keck, and they were able to lo localize and uh, explore the galaxies more in details. They found that the redshift is 0.3, so it's slightly higher than the redshift of the first repeater. Uh, and also no radio source was, uh, or magnet magnetized plasma was uh, uh, related to this FRB. So it seems that this rep uh, FRB and the repeating one are different phenomena and probably are coming from different sources, uh, explained by different processes, or the environments are different. We still don't know. So uh, we, we are trying to understand how to optimize searches for fast radio bursts. For example, uh, SK, as I mentioned, will be very sensitive, but what is the best strategy to find FRBs? So the question is if we are looking at the entire population of fast radio bursts, taking into account very distant and faint ones and also very bright and nearby FRBs, is it better to just look randomly, stare at the cosmic mean beam, or look for fast radio bursts in the cosmic web following the structure near to us? Uh, so that's a question we can actually answer quantitatively. Uh, this is just to show how uh, frequent FRBs are if we take into account the whole cosmic volume, even the dimmer, dimmest ones located further away from us. So uh, we expect a few thousand FRBs per sky per day, as I mentioned, uh, and these predictions are uh, robust uh, for any model of um, progenitors and uh, mechanisms that produce FRBs. We, we know that just because of the amount of FRBs we have already detected. And square kilometer array will be sensitive to FRBs uh, in the different uh, wavelength regimes and uh, different uh, distances from us. So the fact, uh, the question whether it's best to look for fast radio bursts in clusters of galaxies or in a random cosmological beam depends on the properties of FRBs, such as luminosity function, which is just the uh, distribution of FRBs in the intrinsic luminosity. Uh, we don't know if they're uh, kind of like supernovae standard candles, which means they all have the same luminosity, or there is some distribution in the luminosity. So this kind of uh, properties affect predictions and observational strategies strongly. 
Uh, we also still don't know what is the spectrum of FRB, so the distribution of energy as a function of frequency of the FRB. Uh, we have some indications from existing observations, but there is a lot of uh, uncertainty in that. And we also don't know what produces fast radio bursts, so this also adds uncertainty. So if uh, there are many, many faint FRBs, uh, in the luminosity function, then it would be really advantageous to look at nearby galaxy clusters. For example, this is a structure of Virgo cluster, which is located just 16 megaparsecs away from us, uh, and it uh, takes up the huge, a huge volume on the sky. So because it's so close, uh, even very faint FRBs would be detected uh, if we look at this Virgo cluster and if they exist. And this is, again, because of this inverse square law. Uh, so for nearby FRBs, the photons are not so dispersed, and we can detect them with telescopes. So actually, I made predictions for, for this. And uh, with uh, Lorimer and his students, we looked at Virgo, and we didn't detect any fast radio bursts uh, in 700 hours. and it Direct, it uh, straightforwardly means that there are no uh, faint intrinsic FRBs. They are intrinsically very bright. So there is no kind of smooth transition between, at least based on this observation, between uh, pulsars and uh, observed fast radio bursts. So because there are no many faint FRBs, uh, it doesn't matter if you stare at a cluster of galaxies or at an empty cosmological beam, it means that the majority of fast radio bursts would come from large cosmological distances anyway, because they are very bright. Uh, in this exploration, we found out that uh, details such as progenitors or spectrum don't matter much. It's just how many faint uh, Furbies versus luminous they are. OK, and finally, uh, I mentioned that there are no good guesses for what FRBs are, but theorists are trying very hard. Uh, so one key feature that we do understand is that uh, because FRBs are so narrow and bright, they should come from a very small region on the sky. They cannot come from the whole galaxy. And this is because uh, coordinated action is needed to produce such a narrow pulse. If a broad region emits uh, radiation, it would be spread in time just because there is no interaction between uh, different parts of a galaxy. So we understand that FRB should be related to some stellar phenomena or something confined to a small region. And uh, actually, features in the fast radio bursts uh, show that uh, some of them are coming from an event that is as small as 10 kilometers. So it's a, it's a small star or something that creates such bursts. Uh, and also, we always should keep in mind that we still don't know what fast radio bursts are, so there might be few types of them, in particular repeaters and non-repeaters seem to be uh, coming from two different types of astrophysical phenomena. So I, I told you that, uh, in principle, fast radio bursts are similar to pulsar, except that it doesn't repeat, and pulsars are coming from a, neutral, a neutron star that rotates quickly, a similar emission can come from a magnetosphere of a star uh, that creates pulses and uh, interactions, uh, synchrotron emission, and so on. So there are bursts that we observe in our galaxy of a similar type. But the one thing is that they are 10 to the 12 times dimmer than what we observe from fast radio bursts. So it's hard to think that uh, this uh, two things can be coming from the same origin. But actually, we don't understand the, form the neutron stars that well uh, to be claiming that they cannot, so to rule, to rule out this hypothesis. Uh, so there are at least 55 different theories <laughs> that try to explain fast radio bursts, um, uh, and the origins can be white dwarfs, cosmic strings, uh, superconducting cosmic strings, decaying cosmic strings, um, magnetars, 
uh, black holes, and even uh, people were proposing extraterrestrials, uh, spaceships, reflections, and <laughs> lasers in space, and so on. So theorists are really trying very hard, um, but uh, still there is no good theory that would describe them all. Uh, and I'll stop here. I showed you that uh, fast radio bursts are really uh, interesting new type of sources that we still don't understand. They might be related to magnetars or rotating neutron stars, but there are a few orders of magnitude, 12, 10, 12 orders of magnitude difference in the luminosity between the known objects uh, and the in energy of FRBs. There is a wide international effort in detect and characterize these new sources and understand them. And they might be exciting cosmological probes uh, if they are located at high cosmological distances. And uh, once we know how to interpret them and what they are, we, we will be, use, be able to use them for cosmology. Thank you very much for attention.